Um, well, how are you going to email it? To do it. Are you making so I can say, like, I was totally ineffective in that but I didn't do anything. So it's not supposed to figure out what to do from the You have to be able to do Well, I don't think you had to go to that. Yeah, you can open it there. I would have to stage it. You could choose to go there. I hear it. It's all you know. She's been emailing me. I call one day. Well, honestly, they do need a call. So I see that. I'm going to come over and ask. They do need a call. Oh, yeah. 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 I have a new idea. I can't yeah. figure out how to. Yeah, we were up at the park and you were there. Oh, really? No, yeah. I was going to be there. I had an email. But she yeah. called yeah. me yeah. three yeah. times. Yeah. 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 All right, are we ready? Uh, Dave, we're ready when you're ready. So. No, there's no lights, so we just got to figure it out. Okay. He can talk to you, though. No, he can't though. He said they're working on it, but don't have it yet. Right, we must be ready. All right, we're ready. All right. We're on. I'll count backwards. I don't know. Okay, anyway. Flag. So, do we have a flag? We're, yes, we're sir. Okay. Okay. All right. So, good evening and welcome to the Monday, August 26th school committee meeting. This meeting is live and being recorded from our brand new school committee room. We'll begin tonight with Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Longmeadow School Committee maintains educational policies that foster continuous improvement by challenging and supporting all children in a safe and caring learning environment, enabling them to reach their highest potential and to become productive citizens. Through effective communication and positive relationships, the Lawmeadow School could, will make Committee will make informed decisions in the best interest of the students, the schools, and the Lawmeadow community. Is there any correspondence? Oh, uh, no. No correspondence. Uh, moving on to visitor comments. I don't see any visitors, so we'll move on to school committee comments. Anybody have a school committee comment? All right, I guess. Uh, I just want to take a moment to welcome Kelly Ganji, our brand new assistant superintendent for learning. It's her first meeting with us actually in a school committee setting. So I just want to take a moment to introduce you to the community. And you know, if you have anything you want to say, uh, feel more than welcome to. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, soon celebrating my two month anniversary with the Longmeadow Public Schools. So uh, it's been a great summer so far. Coming from the Wachusett Regional School District, where I spent seven years as director of curriculum, uh, and so feel very much at home with the Longmeadow initiatives around learning, RTI, balanced literacy, uh, and the other wonderful things that we're working towards. So glad to be here. We're definitely glad to have you. Thank you. So, uh, other than that, uh, anybody else have any other comments? Okay move right along into the superintendent's report. That was fast. <coughs> yeah, no, I try to keep things moving. The, <coughs> thank you. <laughs> to start with, the move to the new building has been wonderful. We're enjoying our new location immensely. 
We also want to take a few minutes to thank Diane and Tom. There's an awful lot happening behind the scenes here that people visually won't see when you visit us. We have some furniture that shouldn't be here, other furniture that didn't arrive, what office it went to. It's been an awful lot of work. So I want to thank Tom and Diane for their extra efforts. Mm -hmm. it, looks, it looks like it was an easy move. It wasn't in many ways. So thanks for the great work. Technology discussions are underway. We have a committee meeting set up for September 19th in the new administrative um, conference room, which is also the school committee room. We're using both names. I'll switch to school committee room. The tech advisory board meeting. Diane did call to ask if we could uh, set up a meeting with the town advisory board meeting since the chair is the one who calls the meeting. She's um, left messages twice and we have not heard. So we'll continue to follow through, but we do not have a meeting set up. I can reach out to him, Diane. And he did, I want to correct that, he did respond, um, and I don't know when because of the moon, move and all that, um, but he said that he would arrange a meeting sometime in September. Okay. Terrific. Okay, great. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. It, it would be good to have that in September because we are looking to talk, to, uh, talk about one-to-one -one at the high school, so I'd like to get the the school department's technology committee aligned with the town advisory committee so that would be great if we could meet in September the school building committee met last week to review our progress we are asking for a punch list and I thank Jim who's really on top of this and John for his support because we really need to get that punch list the report that I've been given is that we have a year to fulfill that 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 and we withhold money but Tony leaves November 1st and I'd really like to see a lot of this work done before Tony leaves the site because that's where I think we'll have the most sure. most ability to complete tasks mm -hmm. while he is still here and we haven't yeah, could you explain punch list for the audience sure the punch list is a list of items that have not been completed the architect goes around makes a visual <coughs> list of what he thinks needs to be done it then goes back to Gil to Gilbane who finishes up some of the items on the list then the, the architect gets it again and they keep whittling it down the last time I saw it which about two which was about two months ago it was probably three inches thick that's how many items were on the list um, three inches of a document so they told me that it's still a good there were still a good number of uh, amount of items on the list Jim <coughs> just for clarification so that People don't think we have three three inches of stuff to be yet to be done. It, it was, we, you and I and John, I don't think are clear about what's actually left because it wasn't clear in the meeting what was left. There was three pages worth or three inches of stuff that has been done, with some yet to be done, and the, the to be done they've committed now to come back on September 9th in a September 9th meeting and tell us all what that is. But <clears throat> to, to your point, Marie, it's not very clear what's left. But I don't think there's, at least I hope, <laughs> there is not three inches worth of stuff. Tom to Murphy done. told me it was still a substantial list. Mm. And I said, is it going to be as thick as the last document? And he said, close. That would be unfortunate at best. Very unfortunate. Right. Well, I mean, which is why I feel the need to really right. be persevering right. to get this list. Right. Katie. When does our one year time clock begin for this deadline? Is it already begun? You said we have one year to complete uh, the. I believe there's one deadline in February. I thought it was from occupants. But we don't. It, it 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 doesn't end because we don't pay them until we are satisfied with the work that's been done. The issue is that when Tony leaves, Gilbane is not on site. So then you get into a. Shall I say a battle over how much money we really owe them, and how much work we're willing to let go. So it's really just better to get this list now and try and get all the repairs done. Because he said she's exactly, yeah. exactly. So they will be here at the next meeting. Uh, Bobby uh, Barquette, Peter Greenberg, Tom Murphy, and Rob Alger will be at the next meeting with this information for us. Because you know, I think at this point, it's this. I mean, this is our building. Um, school building committee is still you know running the show a little bit, but. We've assumed responsibility over Building C. We're now officially moved into Building B or Building A, and Building B is about to open. So, you know, we we certainly have a responsibility at this point to ensure that we get everything we need accomplished prior to them leaving. Because at the end of the day, we're going to be the ones stuck with whatever's not done, and that's not a a good situation as far as I'm concerned. So, and I've mentioned this to Jim in keeping 
uh, tabs with my other superintendent friends. They say that the one failing of most of the committees is to have that punch list done, that you live with a lot of things that cost you money over the long run because you didn't keep tabs on the punch list. Mm -hmm. And Jim was very good about asking about it and pushing for it. And they told us they're going to tighten it up and then give us what is actually the list mm -hmm. from both parties. So we'll say. Yeah, I will say just I know you're on the subject. I was going to talk about it as well. So I'll do it here, I guess, is that it is, <coughs> my, in my view, disappointing that it's not readily available. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's something that you use, any project manager you use to manage a project, and it should be at any time easily push a button and here it is, and it doesn't seem that easy. So uh, it gives you the impression that it's not well managed, and that could be wrong. That right. could be wrong, but it just gives you that impression. So hopefully on the 9th when they come here, it will be very clear about what's left, and it won't be a difficult thing to work our way through. Because I don't think we'll have the... We won't have another SBC meeting before the ninth, so no. so it will really be up to you know them to bring information. So, can I ask a silly question? Please, if they don't have it readily available, how do they know themselves what actually needs to be done? Well, that's my that's my point. It's I, it's it, so it is ex it's it, it, we'll have to wait till I get here, but it's expressed right. that it's a, it's managed by three different people, three different lists for three different buildings, and in. Potentially different formats. I say potentially because I'm not sure about this, but certainly not in a format that somebody wants to just spit out and say, here it is. So, um, so I just don't yeah, understand how they're even going to be able to answer our questions you. if it's. Well, like, if that's why I actually yeah. gave them to the ninth. They, they were going to be here to <coughs> excuse me today, uh, but they thought it would be difficult yeah. to get ready for today, so we gave them until. The I think I think a part of it is also making sure that they are able to answer the questions that we would have because. Uh, this is, you know, for all intents and purpose, the uh, really the first time that I know they're meeting with the select board next week, but really the first time that they're going to have to answer questions from people who are not school building committee members. So I think that they're a little cautious about what information they're putting in front of us, and probably rightfully so, but, uh, you know. We'll see. Tough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, like it, it, you know, it does give you the wrong impression, but we'll have to wait yeah. and see what happens. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. <clears throat> new staff orientation. We hired 27 new staff members that actually came to orientation the other day. Uh, Kelly did a great job of running a meeting where they are aligned with their mentors that they're taught about the Long Meadow culture as well as able to ask questions and learn about what 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 we do here. I think that what we looked for are staff that have a proclivity to excel in the classroom. We look for team players, able to communicate well, intelligence, and knowledge of curriculum. And I think if we have the people that are willing to work with others, we know that they're going to be doing a great job in Longmeadow. Opening day today was highly successful. Marsha Haar um, and I gave speeches as well as um, Michael Clark. And Michael Clark did an outstanding job in representing the school committee. Well, he was very well received as he told people that he would be supportive as the whole board would be as we move forward in this fiscal year, which may be a challenge. The faculty meetings directed by the principals were held at each of the six schools and word from all the principals um, word was that, that everyone had great meetings and opening days. I will say that the spirit at the um, convocation was very high and people were very positive. The educator evaluation tool, Kelly is also spearheading efforts to reshape the evaluation tool into a more user-friendly document. We met with the LEA and the administration today to review a draft proposal. The meeting went very well. We have a few more meetings to discuss this to see if we can pilot an easier document so that it's definitely one that people can use and that it's easier for the ev evaluator in giving information, but it's also easier for the teachers in terms of having to document a lot of information. If it's observed in the classroom, they won't need to do that. Uh, in addition to this list, building tours, Tom Mazza, Mike Rabel, and I went on building tours to look at all of the different buildings. They're in excellent shape. The custodians have done a Herculean effort in terms of getting them ready. Floors are shining, bathrooms are clean, classrooms are ready. So thank you to, uh, to Mike, Adrian, and uh, Tom for making sure that the buildings were ready. RTI, the elementary principals, Kelly and I have been de developing staff development plans for the RTI response to intervention for this coming year. 
The middle school principals will also foco focus on it this year. Kelly also did a um, huge presentation for the staff today, the elementary staff. It was very well received by them. They not only had a presentation where Kelly broke it down what RTI was, what it looks like in terms of assessment and interventions, but uh, they then broke down into groups where she had eight facilitators meeting with eight different groups and in that they were asked what they what they needed in terms to make this work what what the obstacles they saw so she's bringing that information back to the administrative team Japan uh, I, I wrote quite a bit about Japan here and what I think I'm going to do right now is just go through some slides for you and talk a little bit about the trip it was it, it was definitely um, prodigious to go and see this magnificent culture in terms of people. I think the one thing that that caught my interest the most, the students are like American students. They're fun, they're joyful, they're fun loving. People had a great sense of humor there and I think that, okay we're doing lights. So I think that it was absolutely magnificent. I got to meet with the Minister of Education and the Minister of Foreign Affairs to talk about education through the first part of the trip. The first, uh, one of the first stops was the devastated area from the tsunami. This was absolutely heartbreaking, heart-wrenching to see what had happened. 300 miles wide, the tsunami hit the shore, and two and a half miles inland. The only thing that was left standing was um, a school because it was up to code. The principal heard that the tsunami was coming through um, sirens. He brought 500 students up to the rooftop, and they were there for 36 hours. Uh, while on the rooftop, they saw bodies going by, houses, cars, trucks being washed beyond them. And the students kept asking about their families. The principal had to lie to them and say that he was sure their family was up at the high ground. Um, after 36 hours, they had only lost one child, and the rest he managed to um, keep alive. But you can see from the beach the devastation, the foundations of houses where people went back and put flowers, and things like the glove. You'd find little, little glimpses of life in, in, um, in the dirt around you. Is some of that area radioactive now? We were not that far north. We, I think up north it is, but That's not where, where the, we the were. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're still struggling with that. They definitely are still struggling. Uh, again, the foundations you can see, that was actually floor tile in a home. Over to the bottom left, those, those are pieces of what I found out, um, inside one of the foundations. The red writing is it's a soup it's soup spoon the uh, handle to it and that me that says teacher on it which was I thought uh, very very touching given we were educators that were over there a piece of a teacup a piece of a floor tile a piece of a pot that flowers had been in a piece of wallboard and a piece of sea glass so it made you wonder who lived in the house had they escaped were they at home was the teacher in the school one of them that was su survived what happened to his or her family. There were also many, many elderly that were still there. This man is showing his wife um, something off in the distance. People were returning to bring flowers, okay? This gentleman, he was an older gentleman that came on his bike and he just sat there. We were there for about 45 minutes and he never moved. He just sat on his bike looking. So it was things like that that were just absolutely um, devastating to see. We went up into the mountains. These are the children that were relocated from the tsunami area. You can see the metal houses. They're, um, they're the temporary housing, even though the kids have been in them for two years with their families. The joy of the children was contagious, and we thought this is absolutely amazing that they've been through such a horrendous experience, but they're still able to, um, to regather and, and to share happy moments with us. The students make their lunches every day. The food comes in, they heat it up, and then they serve one another. Uh, it, it really is something to see. They cooked for us, they gave us our food. Okay. 
and everyone loved the fact that they cleaned their classrooms. They actually scrubbed the floors when they're done. They washed the dishes. So we were, the, the American educators, which were from 15 different countries, 15 different states, we all said that will never go over in the United States, but they're as cute as can be. The, the, um, this is one of the high schools we visited when I was visiting our partners up in Takikawa. They um, asked me if I wanted, would I wear a kimono? I said that was fine, and then we had a tea ceremony. So uh, this is a tea ceremony club where the students actually practice the old traditions and pass them on to the next set of students that come in. Okay. Art is highly valued too. You have um, art classes. This is Takikawa West High School where the students were engaged in create in a lot of creative activities. They had competitions where they chose a song and it was student directed. They wrote a musical and performed it for their peers. They had flower arranging, t-shirt competitions, and more. And at the end, one of the homerooms won. It was really quite, quite amazing to see. I mentioned it to the staff today that I'd like to see more of that type of activity. And when the MCAS is said and done, is there any way that we could actually free time up for students to actually be creative and to think about the creativity, the communication, the collaboration, all the four C's that we're talking about that promote higher level thinking. So that was neat to see. Uh, that's Takikawa High School to the left where a lot of those creative lessons were going on. The couple to the right, I was with uh, the American delegation and as I'm walking past this, this bar, I'm looking at them from the outside and they're looking at me so I stopped to take the picture and they just cheered me and gave me a cheer and I had a good shot of them. So. The top picture is the American delegation. We were in trying all kinds of different food. Uh, Steve, the Asian man, was of <coughs> Korean and Japanese descent, so he knew what food to order so that we uh, experimented, but it wasn't too outrageous. Down the bottom, it is the picture of me in the glider. I actually did go in the glider. It was phenomenal to be flying up in the air with no sounds other than the pilot talking to me on occasion. We visited Tokyo, but we also had the pleasure of going to the U.S. Embassy. We met with the, uh, the ambassador. The pictures to the right are actually pictures at, um, at the, minister, the, the ministry where we met with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Education. There's new alignment going on in the curriculum that's similar to the Common Core. We found that very interesting to see. The, um, U.S. ambassador is working a lot on the reaction to the, uh, or supporting the tsunami efforts to try and bring back housing and schools to that area. But uh, it, it was fun meeting with all these different people to see what was happening in education. It is amazing that China and, and Japan are going more toward creative, but still pushing the Common Core in the same way that we are. People often ask, how was the food? So I took a picture of the pork guts stew. I did not eat it. I just thought it would be something for people to see what was on a menu of one of the places that we went. Okay. Uh, that's the American delegation up top where we met at the Japan Foundation. And down the bottom is a picture of um, students. It, it was amazing because most of the time students were not in rows. They were sitting like this, they sat in pairs, but they were working together th in every single classroom that we went in. And that was interesting to see. There were a lot of hands-on activities. Every science class had hands-on activities going on. Uh, and that, th it would have been like walking into our high school to see that. The young men over to the left, also in Takikawa, they um, were giving opinions. Uh, some of the opinions were centered around things like they have clubs after school, but if they play soccer, they play soccer for the year. If they, if they do fencing, they do fencing for the year. And their opinions were that they should be able to take more clubs. Also, one of the young men wanted to know why he was studying and did he really need it for college or were they just courses that they were having him take. So they had some pretty strong opinions, but their English was great. They presented for us in English. I was very impressed with the level of their um, ability to speak our language. And whatever it was, everybody wanted to do the victory sign, so that was 
something that we all participated in. Again, here's some of the science labs down, down to the right. Uh, this sport over to the left, it's like Kindle or something like that, but they uh, have swords, they whack each other with sticks, and they scream as they go at each other. It's an ancient sport. I did try it, and I felt like I got a lot of tension out by doing it, but it's not something I think I'd want to do every day after school. So, okay. Those are some of the rice fields, and the man and woman are looking at a temple in the mountains. Okay. That temple is made out of gold. This is down in Kyoto. And then the uh, picture to the top left, people at noon go to pray at the temples every, um, every single day. And then pictures to the top right and bottom right, it's the fish market. It's one of the largest fish markets in the world. It was fascinating to go and see the fish and how it operated. There I was helping some of the fish market people. So that was an that was a actually an American group that was visiting in um, the fish market. Okay. That was the Minister of Foreign Affairs where we were exchanging cards. The welcome to Takikawa. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but the reception, the chairs were on the floor. It, it was like sitting in a chair with no legs. So that was the reception that I went to the first night. It was quite luxurious with a, quite a wide array of food. And those are former um, superintendents in the Takikawa district. To the left is, is a group that was performing um, in a music festival. And to the right, the preschoolers, it was a hot day, so they just had them go out in their skivvies. They had a, a pool full of fish, and they took their fish, and then when they actually caught it, they went over to a poster, and they were able to identify what fish it was by looking at the poster. It was really a cute activity. And then uh, they were doing their engineering work with their digging and getting water to run down tunnels and all kinds of things. So it was, it was really fun to see the preschoolers. The preschoolers made me some pictures to bring back to the United States, and that's some of my fans right there. And then down the bottom, the, um, the three of the hosts that took me around, uh, Yaz, um, Akai, and the Minister of Education, who was very, very, very kind to me while I was there. Down on the bottom right, they take their shoes off, and those are the, actually the um, places where you put your shoes every day. The um, superintendent of schools is with, um, with the uh, calligraphy, okay? I'm learning how to do calligraphy, all right? The ta uh, Takikau wind band, so you can see that music's very important as well as the tradition. This, again, the science labs were, were really hands-on and they had really great equipment in there. This is one of the few classrooms that had rows. It was a math class, but the students were up at the board and they were um, doing problems on the board, very similar to an American math class. Okay. The backpacks were similar everywhere you went. Again, small group work. Uh, it looked like if you went into, went into one of our first grade classes. The art was phenomenal. The uh, stained glass window was made out of paper, cut up in small, uh, small amounts, and there were maybe 50 of them hanging. That was part of the competition. Each class had to make a stained glass window, and they were a substantial size. The flower competition, the young lady with her flower, um, and then just students around the school. Okay. Here's the glider ride. I'd recommend it highly. Okay. Okay. That's a uh, sake factory up up above. It shows the process of making sake and then just some of the countryside down below. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Takikawa really is, um, in particular, a gorgeous area. And that concludes my visit to Japan. Are there any questions? Yeah, how do you control the slides? Kelly oh, is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. Who's <coughs> that man? Hi, Jack. No, no <laughs> I blink and they flip. It was a really nice thing. Yeah. Okay. Marie, how many students were in each class? It wasn't bad. There were only ab about 25. They were, it was unbelievably similar to our country. Yeah. Yeah. It w it very small sizes down in the elementary r grades, maybe 22. And was it, um, it was all public, but the girls were wearing uniforms? Some, it seemed like the girls wore uniforms and the boys had, didn't. The boys had uniforms too, okay. usually white shirts, blue pants, but they might have a sweater or something on. Okay. Um, it was different schools that the shots were from too. Most had uniforms, some did not. So that's probably what you're picking up, some of them that didn't. Uh, it, the public schools mostly had uniforms. I'm trying to think, there, there was actually one Catholic school we visited where they did not wear uniforms and they had the best technology going. It was reversed. There was a, certainly a lot of money that uh, somehow had been donated to that school. That's great. So. How long was their school day? You mentioned Much long. longer. <laughs> their school day started at about 8.30, 9 o'clock, and they were there till about 5 o'clock. And then they did activities? No, the activities, the school day stopped at about 3.30, and they did activities till about 5. So, and they picked that one club for the year? One club for the year. Even Is that in elementary school as well, or just in high school? They didn't have clubs in elementary school. They tended to get out at 3.30 and then went home. Okay. Was there any uh, discussion of World War II and um, post-World War II? Did you get into the, any of the curriculum of the, say, like, history? Because there's some, a real struggle inside Japan today about telling the truth about World War II. You know, yeah, it, well. it was, it was a uh, topic we all avoided because it was probably just too painful to do that. I think they talk now about American relationships being very positive and strong. So to bring up World War II, none of us wanted to do that. I was just wondering how the, though they, did they cover it in their in the history, in their history classes at the high school? They didn't say, but one thing that was evident when you went to Tokyo and and um, and some of the major cities, there was nothing left. Tokyo is a completely modern city because everything's wiped out. Mm -hmm. Kyoto is one of the only places. Um, in the Tokyo area that, and that was still a drive, that had anything left because it wasn't bombed by the Americans. That's where the, the um, Gisha district is still intact, the old houses, as well as, um, as, as well as the temples. Any other questions for me? And you're going to do a much more in-depth presentation, is that true? Or is this? This is it. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> we had a lot of conversations. <laughs> we did. And I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get it together because of opening day, but I was That's able right. to. That's so. right. Okay. But I'm happy to do another for you if you'd like I'm <laughs> offline. This is the second time today I've seen this, so I feel good okay. about it. But, I thought um, you would. Marie, did you also just want to mention very quickly mm -hmm. why some of us have these nice nifty black Oh yes. Uh, uh, bracelets? Kelly and some of her cur curriculum coordinators were talking about the idea of when, what I need. So what I need is about what staff need in terms of getting their job done, what students need in terms of learning, what school committee needs in terms of helping to support us, and parents in terms of what they need to help their children be successful. So every staff member was given a bracelet that says win, and on the other side, what I need. So we're going to try and really work to win to have all students learn at high expectations, and, um, and the bracelets are significant to help us remember that. Appropriately named Win, which is a good theme for the year. Win. I would just say. So. All right. Any other questions for Marie? Okay. We'll move right along into chair report. Uh, I've had a busy couple days, to be honest with you. Um, so the first thing I want to do is John had pointed out over maybe a couple days ago that the 23rd of December we have a meeting scheduled, being two days before a major holiday. Uh, it may be difficult uh, for some people to make it. I know that we did hear some from school committee about that. So uh, I'd like to reschedule that meeting, if at all possible. And that we probably have warrants, right, that we need to do? 
That would be accurate. We would have warrants, but we can do them during the day. Okay, so we can do warrants during the day. Um, do we want to, why don't we schedule, I mean, I don't know what sort of business we're going to have, obviously, at that point in time. Do we want to schedule a full school committee meeting for the 16th, and then we can schedule a short warrant meeting for the 23rd in the morning? A nice 10 minute one. That, I, I feel good about that? I can't make the 16th. Why don't we just do the full up one plan plus a short one for the warrants, unless something drives it some other way. Just do the warrants and then... Oh, isn't there a meeting planned already? That well, we have one for the 23rd that we're going to reschedule. Yeah, but I mean the second Monday would be... The 9th. The, the 9th, 9th, right? So which we're meeting the so 9th. So I assume we're meeting. Yeah. Right, so you have that meeting, and then if, unless we have a, a need for another full-up one, we just do the warrants on... That's fine. I mean... The 23rd so you want to skip... How about the 26th? Yeah, and the 26th. Is that warrant. feasible? Well, I think we're just going to look to do like a 10 a.m. on the 23rd. Yeah. Ten minutes. I'm not going to be here. Okay. I mean, yeah. But that way, it'd be just a warrant meeting. All right. Yeah, and I was, I was just proposing having a full one, and we can cancel it if, if there's no business that we need to do. Just, in, just so we have it down, and everybody knows to be. It almost never gets canceled. It, I'm it just get, letting it, you know. It will get created if it's needed, <laughs> but it won't get canceled if it's not. All right. Well, no, that's I'm, I'm fine. I'm <laughs> fine with that. If you want to, if we want to do that, um, that's fine. What is it you want to do? We're gonna just we're just gonna schedule a warrant meeting for that week, the vacation weekend. That so week. All right. So you'd have this, the full up one, right. the second week of the month, or second Monday of the month, whatever, right? Right. And then we'd have the next meeting that month would be the short warrant meeting. And if there's a need for a larger school committee discussion, we could either have it that morning at the tenth, about, or I mean, the twenty third about some issues, or just do a warrant meeting and, and not have a busier agenda. So, do we want to say 10 a.m. on the 23rd? Sounds fine. Is that fine with everybody? Yeah. I vote no. Okay. Well, I you won't be here. prefer the 26th. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be here. Is the 26th going to be too late for warrants? Okay, the 26th will be too late for warrants. Okay. okay. But do we right only need four people? Yeah, we only warrants? need a, yeah. a bare quorum. I need a few people. Okay. And obviously, if there's a larger agenda, I'll make sure that everybody's aware of uh, the other topics that are going to be out there. Sorry. So. Yeah, let's do the 23rd. Okay. Do you have that, Diane? But thank you for bringing that up, John, because that's a good catch. Okay. Um, Katie had also brought up to me that there is a, that some of the parents at, she had ran into at Center School the other day uh, were a little concerned about the state of the playground. And as the community may remember, uh, the playground and the, and the adjacent field were funded by town meeting as part of a uh, community preservation. Um, funding. So, Tom, did you want to just speak a little bit about what's going on with the playground? Um, yeah, so we've decided we've gone out and solicited quotes for the actual playscape equipment. We have two vendors who responded with pricing and we are putting the site work for the playscape and the actual field under one general contractor. Mm -hmm. um, DPW will oversee that project. They are developing specifications uh, we'd hope to have bids back by the end of September okay. with a goal of uh, work beginning hopefully at the end of October, the begin at the end of October, beginning of November. Um, project I would estimate take maybe two to three weeks. Okay. Great. Uh, that good for you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, as Marie had mentioned this morning, we had opening day, and uh, I did have the privilege to address the staff, and hopefully they enjoyed what I had to say. Uh, but it was great to see everybody this morning. Everybody seemed very excited about the coming year, for the most part. Uh, some people were still in summer mode, but other than that, um, the high school dedication working group, I guess we're a working group, has been meeting, uh, and we do have a lot of, we've done a lot. Um, Kim has designed all of the invitations. I think everybody's had a chance to see them, and they're beautiful. Uh, and we're going to be sending out postcards to the entire community. So everybody's going to know what day this is. It's going uh, to be on Saturday, September 28th at 10 o'clock AM here at Long Meadow High School in the front of the building. And uh, there will be inside seating as well for, uh, for people who don't want to be outside. Uh, Treasurer Grossman has already confirmed that he will be here. 
Uh, so that's an exciting thing. Um, we have also just finished the list for all of the actual invitations. Um, and we're sending out actual invitations to department heads, to members of boards and committees throughout the town, to building principals, to people who have been, you know, involved in this project from the very beginning. Uh, so, you know, those are going to be nice. And uh, we're also planning a dinner for uh, residents who live near the high school. So pretty much Grassy Gutter, Woodside Drive, some people on Williams, some people on Bliss, and all of those side streets in between, uh, just to thank them for their patience uh, and for suffering through the last three years of construction and dust and debris, of uh, you know vibrations. And uh, so that's going to be Thursday night, the 26th at 5.30. We're going to do a, a light dinner for them and uh, tours of the building. And hopefully, uh, you know, we get a good turnout because we do want to say thank you to them. Uh, and then on Friday, the 27th, we are inviting the seniors to uh, come. And Kayla Worland this morning told us that she would be happy to have her students put on a concert for uh, our guests. And then we're going to have lunch and tours for them as well. And then on Saturday, the main event, we'll do the dedication. And uh, we will then cut the ribbon on the school, invite everybody in for some light refreshments, and again, some tours of <laughs> the school. A lot of touring going on. So it's really coming together. Uh, Katie's been invaluable. Kim's been invaluable. And uh, I'm very excited about this. So it's coming along. Janet. One question. Have, has anybody thought to contact the soccer board about soccer games over at Russell Field on that day? No. Um, might want to do that because I know yeah. personally my son's teams are scheduled for games and I'm thinking parking for this event plus people wanting to attend right. there are going to be conflicts so yeah, well, just heads up that Russell a, Field is currently slated to be used that Saturday for soccer games okay. we'll reach out to the soccer committee or you know soccer association thank you hmm yes so we'll, I'll, we'll reach out to them in the morning um, and make sure that they're aware and if they have the opportunity to move games. And we'll obviously, I think Mike knows, but I'll, I'll reach out to Mike again tomorrow. Um, if they have the opportunity to rearrange their schedule a little bit, I, don't know, I hope they will because we're hopefully expecting a large crowd here, which would be great. Yeah, Michael, um, is that different than Park and Rec? It's, yeah, it's a, they have an agreement with Park and Rec where they're able to use the fields and they do their own we scheduling. Need to notify if we need to do both or if yeah. one would be a blanket. They, I mean, Barry should know. If she doesn't know, she'll know soon that we are planning this event because obviously she's invited. Um, so I'll, I'll reach out to her and I'll make sure that we reach out to whoever's on, whoever heads the soccer association as well. Um, Saturday morning, I attended the tour of the DPW facility that uh, Marie Angelides had invited all of us to. Uh, there was an interesting assortment of people there. There was members of the Conservation Commission, the Tree Committee, Select Board, Capital Planning, and Finance Committee, so it was well represented. Uh, Mike Rabel gave us a tour of the facility, and then a gentleman from Ty and Bond, who did a study in 2008, uh, gave a pretty, a pretty detailed report of the state of the facility. Uh, and I think that it's evident from being there that it's not a great facility. And uh, I think based on the select boards urging that this tour occurs, that there's probably going to be some movement in the next year or two to try to find a solution for the DPW, whether it's renovating <coughs> or building or moving. I'm not sure, but uh, John. I was just wondering if there was any discussion of the fact that that building is located in the floodplain. There was a and large discussion. It has flooded uh, in the spring of 1984. Yep. There was a, that whole area was underwater. There so was a discussion. If they're going to do anything down there, they're going to have to put some kind of a, a berm or a, a dike system in to, yeah. to protect it, which is going to add to the cost. There was are they stuck on that location, or are they thinking? No, of there's there's some other locations that they've examined. Apparently, in two thousand about three or four years ago, there was a committee that examined every possible location within a three mile radius. Uh, they are not stuck on that, uh, that location. And apparently, the guy from Tai and Bond was saying that they can flood proof a certain area of the, the land, but 
if they make it flood proof, the under state law, they need to provide some sort of compensatory, uh, they need to be able, to, I mean, I forgot, it was a compensatory something, where they basically have to flood another area. They have to create exactly that much floodplain somewhere else along the Connecticut River in town. So if they take out 500 cubic yards of floodplain, they need to add it somewhere else, which is a very interesting concept to me. But, but it was a very interesting facility. I mean, they're doing, there's a lot that they're limited in doing, uh, and there's a lot that, is, uh, that they should be doing that they can't do. Um, so regardless of, of what happens with that facility, there's some work that needs to be done. There's underground storage tanks that will need to come up soon. There a sewer line runs right through it that connects Emerson Road to Bondi's Island. There's a lot of interesting stuff ha that happening down there. So, well, just for the record, I'd like to just state they've been talking about this for about the last seven years, mm -hmm. and it's like it, it keeps coming up. There are other places that we might want to prioritize. That's just one area. Okay. So, but you know, certainly it'd be interesting to see what the select board and how the, the town decide to move forward on that, uh, that subject. Um, last week, Tom and Marie and I had a meeting with Stephen Crane and Marie Angelides and Paul Pasterzik to kind of talk about what we thought some of the challenges of the coming year would be. Uh, it was a really good meeting. We had a conversation pretty much about budget at this point, and we talked about areas where we had some concerns, and they shouldn't be any secret that we have a you know, contract, contractual obligations that we need to fulfill. Uh, and the select board and Maria and mentioned some areas where they had some concerns, like increase in health care costs. But the ultimate outcome of the meeting was that we would like to get the joint boards together again prior to the end of October to have a conversation about the budget directive, which is kind of an exciting prospect for me because I don't think that we've ever once been asked our opinion on what the directive should be. Uh, so we are looking to do that. What I had Diane print out for everybody, potentially, or what if, yes, um, which should be on in front of you, is a draft of the minutes from the last joint meeting. And because they're in front of you right now, I don't want to talk about them, per se. We can do that at the next meeting. Uh, but we should obviously have a conversation about what the outcome of this was in areas where we can work together. One of the things that Marie had mentioned she would like to do is ar around Veterans Day is to have a lecture series uh, in a series of veterans events uh, with our cooperation. They'd like to be able to use the auditorium, would like to engage Key Club and other clubs in helping out the Wounded Warrior Run, uh, some areas where, you know, we have no real reason to say no, um, and, you know, in the spirit of, of a community event. So. We'll have some more information on that as soon as it comes to us, but it was a very preliminary meeting um, for right now. Next week, Jim and I are sitting down with Dan Healy to talk about the GFOA uh, that the Finance Committee is pushing that they're going to be presenting to the Select Board next Monday night, which is basically a set of recommendations on increasing transparency and uh, making the budget more approachable from a community standpoint. Uh, looking through the presentation, I think Jim and I can both agree there's 14 points, we probably do 12 of them. So we're in pretty good shape. Uh, so we're just gonna hear what he has to say and get back to this committee on that. Um, and finally, the last thing that I have to say, it's a long update, I've never had one this long, uh, is that Kim had brought up to me uh, just a concern about a goal we'd set up for ourselves at the last, at our goal setting session, which was how do we respond to correspondence? Uh, and she cited a letter that we, two letters that we received from a parent uh, and what our response should be, and particularly with regard to one-to-one -one computing, which I know that we've been talking about and dancing around. And I think that what we, at this point, what we realize is that we don't know. We don't have an answer on what it's going to look like, and we don't have an idea about exactly where it's going to be implemented and exactly what we plan on, on how we plan on doing that. I mean, originally it was going to be K through 12, and now it might just be high school. And so, you know, if if you feel comfortable, uh, obviously I know you've, you've met with this parent, but I, you know, Kim, uh, Kim has been asked to go to Blueberry PTO and talk about it. I think we're going to be getting questions from the community about it. And I think that the answer right now is that we're still working towards it, and we're going to be involving the community as we come towards you know, a solution on how to do it. 
Might I suggest that if you field questions that you let them know that the committee is meeting in September mm -hmm. and that we will have more information and that this is going to impact the high school and it will not impact K through 8. I think that's pretty much what they want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think they want to hear that they're not going, it's not going to impact K through 8 or K through 5. Yeah. Yeah. That's the parents that I deal with more. And feel free to direct them my way or to their principal. Right, Marie? <laughs> Good. Thanks. But All we'll right. definitely, we'll have something very soon. Okay. So, and we really haven't received much other correspondence to kind of fill in the rest of that question. But, you know, I think in kind of keeping with that theme, you know, what do we suggest as far as how do we respond? Do we talk about it as a committee and then, you know, issue a letter or, you know, obviously there's not, not everything that comes our way we're going to respond to. but with questions like this that are about school committee initiatives, we certainly should respond because we are leaders in the community on this issue. Um, so, I mean, is that, that's how we want to proceed with that. I think if you run it by, I mean, we've just kind of all said yes, what you've said is great. And I think the correspondence went directly, did it go to you, the second correspondence on that specific? I think it went, it no, went to you, right? It went to school committee. Yep. So I, I just, think that we should actually respond to the communication. Yeah. So even if it's a I'm not sure what's going on or whatever, I think we should just give some sort of yeah. reply to the email so it's not sitting out there and Yeah. I, I call people back when I have not responded to this one. Right. But I normally call everyone back. Okay. To, to discuss it because when it's especially when it's operational, I feel like I should respond to them, give them an answer. Um, Fortunately, most of the time people are happy with the call, but sometimes they just, they're not. At least some sort of, at least you're giving them I'll a response. Again. I, this one, I just think we should somehow just reply, you know, it's not going to, you're, it's not going to affect elementary school kids. Yeah. We're, we're discussing it in high school and there'll be another meeting in September is probably a very nice yeah. you reply. Okay. Can, okay. All right. Great. That's all I have. So, <laughs> it was a lot, but I promise in the future they won't be too much. Um, Michael, all right. could I respectfully yes. ask that we put the principles? Yes, what I was going to do is that I was going to allow Jim and John to give, and okay. Liz to give the finance update, and because what they're here for ties into that, uh, I was going to have their issue kind of, dub, you know, cut right out of the coattails of that. Fabulous, thank and you. And they, they knew about that. I told them. <laughs> Set. We're all set, so hey, finance hey, report. Hey, John, since you were there and I was out of the meeting, yourself and Liz, can you, can you give a summary? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass it on to Tom. Uh, there is a, a, a vote that we uh, took at the mm -hmm. meeting, and that is on the agenda for later on. But uh, Tom will fill us in on the detail. Yeah, there were uh, a couple of items on the agenda. Uh, Sue Bertrand was there to give an update on special education and uh, just some staffing changes that are going to be taking place with um, some additional ed assistance positions that are being added to the budget that were not planned for, for uh, one student moving into the district from an out of placement um, that we had budgeted for last year. So um, there, uh, we're, we'll be ha adding a, an ed assistant for that um, individual and there's also a student moving into the district from out of state that we had to add an assistant for. So um, that was uh, the major issue that she was there was to let finance sub committee know about that. Uh, I also when yes. you say you ha we're taking a student who was in district but who was living in district but was in an out of district placement back in the schools. Yes. For, okay. Just so. Yes. Bring them back in yeah. from an out of district placement. Um, I updated the finance subcommittee to let them know that we did turn back $195,000. The vote that the school committee took was up to 195, but um, with when all the numbers were done for the year, we uh, hit the total of 195, so we did turn that back uh, for FY13, um, which is just a little over 1.5% of uh, our budget. Um, middle school reading books, there was some curriculum work that was done at the end of June um, to really uh, help bolster the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade ELA um, work and there was a commitment to purchase some reading materials for the middle schools that um, we really found out about kind of mid-summer 
and so we felt obligated to move forward to uh, fund the purchase so that the materials would be in and available for the start of the school year. It's approximately $9,200, and uh, they, they were paid for out of school choice funds. Uh, one-time expenditure kind of going along with the policies or the guidelines that school committee has for use of those funds. Um, and the last item that John referenced is that there was discussion around a request for uh, an increase or an addition of a teaching position at both uh, Blueberry for grade one and at Glenbrook uh, for sixth grade. Um, included in your packet are some enrollment um, historical numbers back when the budget was developed and uh, the number of students that we currently have enrolled at this time and what the average class size would be if we did not um, if we do not if the committee does not entertain approving these increases so uh, finance sub uh, took that up and voted to recommend um, approval of a position for each of those schools in those grades based on the discussion, and I'm sure the superintendent would like to add more to that. <clears throat> I think that we have been watching the numbers pretty carefully. Uh, it's been, it, it, when the budget is formed, I think the question is always rightfully asked, did you know this was going to happen? And the answer is no, we didn't. We look at the NESDAQ projections, we look at our projections, we look at um, the information in front of us at that time. And if you take a look at particularly Blueberry Hills, I had Marie track what happened. In January, uh, for going into grade one, there were 48 students. By August, there were 70 students. We can't, 72. 72 right now? Okay. This, the, the, the families continue to come in numerous every numerous uh, registrants registrants every single day so it's it's unpredictable uh, Glenbrooks was a smaller increase but we had already had you know a larger class size uh, with the Glenbrook sixth grade if I could just add to that then. this is a good faith effort on our part it wasn't a surprise but if you look at the, the sheet we have in front of us um, January it was 48, March it was 51, April it's 53. It kept climbing. Mm -hmm. And uh, all we can do is count the heads as they come in and, and do the best and, and make the plans according to the latest data. But uh, I, I want the audience to know that we were not unprepared for this. We were planning as best we could. But we can't control the number of pe people who are moving into town. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things we like to cite. <laughs> that people are moving into the town to take advantage of our school system, and they are. Tom, we reduced a section of first grade at Blueberry in this current budget, correct? So we're just restoring that. We reduced two sections. Two sections. Okay, so we're restoring one section, correct? Correct. And then we reduced the fifth grade section at center, and we're restoring it, and we'd be adding a section to Glenbrook. So we're kind of still net negative one, as far as sections go. <clears throat> Um, is that, I mean, is that well, fair to say? <laughs> well, as far as the sections, but not as far as the budget. Not as yes. far as the budget. Right. Yes. Right. yes. High level number. Right. <laughs> well, it works out to those. So it still works teachers. out to a negative one. We do not have teachers that we can recall. We are, we would post the positions. Okay. So we have to start from scratch to interview? We are uh, hopeful that we will be able to expedite the hiring process and have people on board for the first day of school. The ALEA in the past has worked with the administration to um, allow for a hiring process with a shortened period of the posting. It usually is a two-week posting period. They've allowed us to post it until filled and Diane's indicating that they they've already agreed that. to allow us to yeah. do that if um, the funding is approved tonight. Okay. In addition, the, the principals have been hiring for the past couple of months, so it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. There are candidates that they have in mind already okay. um, because they've, they've done hiring at similar grades and all the principals are uh, collaborating on who the good candidates might be that are, that are out there. Great. So without further ado, do we feel comfortable making a motion? I move on the recommendation of the Finance Subcommittee that the school committee approve the addition of grade 
one teacher at Blueberry Hill School and a grade six teacher at Glenbrook Middle School to alleviate large class sizes. Second. I have a motion and I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? The motion carries. Uh, the only other thing that I'm going to keep Dan here for, but we're going to do it now, is uh, Dan has his handbook in front of us. So, Dan, do you want to approach the, uh, the microphone? Glenbrook Bulldogs. <laughs> There's a wildcat. Hey. Itself, but it's okay. So we, uh, th this summer we did um, work diligently and um, producing a, an updated handbook. Um, as you look through it, um, in, in keeping with kind of what our goals and what our um, policies have been, we've tried to streamline this to be very similar with Williams and creating more of a middle school um, handbook, um, very similar to our curriculum and our grading processes and so forth. So. Um, any small or minor changes um, that may have occurred um, would have been very similar to the policies in which um, in which Williams has already um, enacted. Um, the first um, major change that we've made to our old handbook um, in regard to policy would be our extended absence policy um, for non-medical absences. That is on page four of our handbook. Um, and basically, we added a line to the bottom. It's in bold face uh, print that basically says, after two weeks of being back at school, no additional credit will be awarded for outstanding work. Um, and this is for students um, who have had an extended um, absence of five or more consecutive days, that once they do return to work, um, return to school, um, they will be allotted two weeks to complete those assignments. Hmm. Um, and you know we feel that that's a pretty extensive time period um, and certainly there are um, extenuating circumstances um, given in, uh, IEPs and 504 plans however for the um, for the, the majority of the students that this would be a, a direct policy additionally on page seven um, with a an additional or a, a uh, very much um, improved or um, added uh, curriculum based on writing. We've added a number of sentences in regard to academic honesty. Um, we had an, uh, a rise in, um, in students uh, basically um, not being academically honest in regard to submission of their work. Um, so uh, if, we, if we read through that uh, paragraph in the second sentence, or the third sentence, I'm sorry, second line, we asked, uh, we asked all students that they not copy their work from fellow classmates or from test book, textbooks or reference materials in the library. Um, additionally, um, we also want to make sure that they're not downloading information from the internet directly um, and that we consider this behavior a form of stealing. Hmm. Um, Moving on to page 11, in regard to student conduct and discipline, um, we've basically added um, additional language um, towards the bottom third of that paragraph um, in boldface um, in regard to bullying and being respected as a student. Um, and we ask that they uh, feel, feel that they do not have to put up with being bullied or disrespected in this school by your peers and that they are to let us know um, if you are having any problems, and we will work with them to solve, and their parents to solve those problems. And the final policy change is on page 14. Um, and here we've basically um, just outlined it, outlined um, in clear terms um, the disciplinary terms used at the middle school level. So these are exactly um, what Williams has in their handbook um, in regard to the offense and the possible discipline. Um, and certainly there's a wide range and they're uh, subject to, um, you know, uh, the administrative um, interpretation of the mm -hmm. severity of the misbehavior. However, this is all dealing with the code of conduct for the, the district for Long Meadow Public Schools. Um, 
You know, additionally, I would like to add again or, or touch again that this is very similar to the handbook that has been previously approved by Williams Middle School. Any questions for Dan? Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We don't need to vote on it, right? No. We do? Whoops. All right, hang on just one more second. Uh, there's no, there's no, okay, that's why I didn't realize it. Okay, can I have a motion uh, to accept the uh, Glenbrook Middle School handbook for 2013-2014? So moved. As presented. Uh, second. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you, Dan. Great, thank you. Sorry for keeping you so long. No problem. Have a good night. Okay. Back to the top. Uh, SBC update. I think we actually pretty much got a good one, unless there's more. Yeah, there is more. There's well, <coughs> one, one, two more things. I guess Marie or Tom, we got to follow up on. One is uh, at that meeting we asked about the MDF room, the server room. Yeah. 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 And it's supposed to be two weeks. We did an update on what the plan was. So it is two weeks. I haven't heard anything back. Uh, so there's there's two issues there. One is the uh, air conditioning unit needs to be moved to a more efficient place as far as cooling the servers in the room and the other is one of do we or do we not build a redundant system to address issues of case of failure. Um, I'm strongly an advocate for a redundant system just because that makes sense to me in my past experience but we have to get people on board but uh, the bottom line is it's two weeks we're so expecting some something back from Bobby or the other guy, which I'll have to remember, Tom. Rob Tom Murphy. Tom Murphy, yeah. Rob Alger. Tom Murphy would be the one. We're supposed to come back and do something, so we haven't heard back. We had a follow-up on that. So the update is that they continue to not be able to put their hands on information? No, the MDF room is a different issue. That's, but the, is, it, is that part of, is that separate then, or is that it's part of the separate issue. List? It's just, no, it's actually not on the punch list right now for some reason. It should hopefully should, it should be added. But this is an issue specifically to the environmental control of the server room. But it's the same people that are responding to our request for information about the Oh, it's the same. So yes, that's what yes. I, yeah, it's the same. They just. Yes. Um, so <coughs> talked about bill naming. I guess the only other issue is uh, I assume since we're in the building that the temporary occupancy certificate was all signed and done. It's an assumption <laughs> on my part. Tom's not. Hopefully, hopefully it was. Yes, it was. Because that was an issue of conversation. Um, and that's. That's about it. There was an executive session, but I can't go through that, so we'll do that later. Well, there is one other issue. I, I don't know if you're aware of this. There is another computer closet over here, and it, it, the assumption was that it belonged to LCTV. It's partially ours and partially LCTV's. There's no air conditioning in there either. And I won't throw out numbers, but it was a significant amount of money that they need to put an air conditioner in there. So this is like the MDF room, and it's a, uh, I, I right. so, understand. So I don't want to like, give a long discussion, but, but we all, all understand that computers, especially server racks, create a lot of heat. Yep. Yes. Right? And, and they need air conditioning to keep, keep the room cool. They, it's just needed. And, and so, uh, and it ought to be redundant because a lot of valuable information is in there, including the value and cost of the hardware in case it fails. So, so you need both a primary system to keep something cool and a secondary system in case that primary doesn't work, right. right? So we ought to go through and identify all those and just get this thing locked and loaded because it just doesn't work. I don't, I, it's hard to understand that we get this far and, um, So we have I, two rooms that have a similar... Yeah, there's, it sounds like there's one down, not, I'm actually in the wrong building now, but, but one downstairs in the main high school area and then one, really hear that water right I there. guess there's one over here and is this the same battle we're um, kind of like the require the requirements were not specified clearly depending on who you want to talk to from uh, hey <coughs> how much cooling capacity do you need where do you need the cooling capacity what's the room going to be used for and it doesn't need to be redundant the argument would be, well, you're building me a computer room, you should know that, right? Aren't I mean, we paying them to know that, though, because we are not the experts on construction and well, architecture and that kind the of only, stuff? The only thing I will defend the, con the architect for a little bit is if you not know specifically what you're putting in the room, how much power you're going to dissipate, where it's going to be located, it's hard to actually design a room. 
However, that being said, there ought to be, if you're putting a computer room in, somebody ought to ask, what am I actually going to be doing in it, right? I mean, so there should have been some conversation back and forth. And Jim, I was at those meetings. Kevin was explicit <coughs> on what was going to be in those right. rooms. So, so there so clearly is a, is a problem here. Now, you're at the past the end, you know, the uh, goal line right now because you're actually running. You we're running with servers that are running and potentially in trouble. And I know Kevin's had to go through and few of the shoes we've had to replace hardware and so on. So it's actually the urgency level is very high right now to get the systems set up properly, get the redundancy set up properly so we don't have to worry about it and, um, and move on. Well, starting on Tuesday. That's actually doesn't have to, you don't have to worry okay. about school starting. You actually have to worry about the fact, the servers are being used right now, right? So We're just hoping they're not going to overheat. Yeah, you got it, right. And in some cases they have already have. Um, and we've replaced hardware and so on. So what do we have in there right now until we solve the problem so we don't Some temporary air conditioning units. You have a four-ton air conditioner, two-ton air conditioner. I want it four. We have two, we have two, a two-ton air conditioner. If you think of a server being located here, it's on the front. The heat comes out there. You actually need to get the air conditioner back over here. Um, I don't know what's in this cabinet over here. If it's, it's a, a if it's temporary system. unit that is exhausted up into the <coughs> so, space. Above so the bottom line is, that in my it's personal it's opinion, it's an urgent it's issue that needs to be resolved. I agree with you. Um, and and, then, and we look the for the architects and and Tom and those guys to go oh, get this thing nailed down. Yeah. Uh, that's Tom Murphy. That? I don't want yes. to be accused of Tom. It's Tom Murphy, <laughs> Bobby Parkett, and those guys need to take this on. And I, I think it's very good that they're coming in to meet with us so that we have clear answers and timelines. That MDF room, that problem has been going on now for how many months? Well, it took forever to get just people in a room to understand Six, there's yeah, a problem. Six months so it's not been unfortunate. Kim? I'm going to hold off. Go ahead. Okay. Katie? I, I'm just stunned that this is, you know, millions and millions of dollars that it's just, you know, in everybody's kind of looking around like you know not I mean you know the people that we have entrusted are this building with are sort of like oh geez mm -hmm. jeepers that's so, that's lousy and I, I I mean I just I'm flabbergasted it's I had I heard uh, there is no hot water is there hot water now I didn't know there was, I didn't there was no hot water and when the teacher said I gee I, I'd like some hot water they said I don't think you know how to turn on hot water was the explanation that he wasn't turning the faucet on correctly. I think we should be careful about rumors. But yeah, I would. But this is not. This is like the experience firsthand. You know, what am I? What do I have to say about the fact that was this that teacher experience? No, today. Oh. Well, we have automatic water. Yeah, but it wasn't. There was no hot. Oh. oh. Okay, it's not calibrated. So, I'm. You know, it just. And it seems like everybody kind of. You know, the. At least, you know, and our architect, construction people just continue to kind of look around without. You know, we have six months left to do this before our timeline ends. We we have no end because we can withhold money. But, but by the time that our year ends in February. We can still withhold money. But they don't have to do anything? Is that the They won't get paid the rest of the money that we owe them. So is the money we're withholding <coughs> enough to cover this if we had to hire the proper people to get it done? That's a good question to ask when they come. I, I, um, I think we should. Yeah, the, the issues there is that gets a complex answer, but I'm going to make it short the way I told it. Is the uh, contractor has signed up for a maximum price contract. right? So everything needs to be done. Whatever it costs him, if it costs more than we've already paid him over that maximum price, he still has to close and do it. Right? By February or? Well, I didn't is give it a date. I'm not Well, no, I'm, that's what I mean. Is that I is think a year after the occupancy date, which would be like a year after February. February. Yeah. We actually sign up, not a, a not temporary occupancy, but an occupancy, right? So I lost my train. Oh, I'm, I'm back. So, so that's all right. So, so the issue is we're paying a maximum amount of money to finish the job, right? So, and he's got a maximum contract price. So, because he's got to get it done within that maximum contract price, it won't cost us any more to do that. The, the <coughs> issues become uh, one which we think we might have worked our way through that, hey, for instance, if I use a server room as an example, you never told me about that, right? So it's an extra cost. And, and you can kind of go back and forth. But we think that's going to be a wash. However, uh, at the end of the day, um, this budget is coming in very, very, very close. Right? And so, and so um, 
there's not a lot of money floating around. And people are talking about holding back money. The real issue is we've paid them a lot of money already. So there's not a lot of money to hold back. Uh, it's really pushing them to get the job done. And, 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 okay. and, and just it's making more sure about they getting it work. Right. And making sure you stay on top of them to get the job done and you have decent plans to get the job done. And that's why this punch list is, can be so irritating mm -hmm. because it, it, it should be, I'm repeating myself, I understand, but it should be readily available and easy to understand and trackable, right? So, so reverting to my old days, we ought to have a list of what's there, not only what's there, but how long has it been there, mm -hmm. so you the aging, and then when are you going to get it done? So you can see something that's brand new, you know, let's say this room just came up and it's brand new, okay, put it on the list. But it could be something that's been on the list for a year. Right. And you say, well, what, what's going on? All right, so, so you can look at aging, what the item is, how important it is, and when's the planning to get done. That's what we need to know. And that's what I told Bobby and team that day, mm -hmm. right? Yep. About five times. So hopefully we'll get there from here. I've had the same conversations, but I, I do thank school committee, and again, I, I thank Jim, because his consistent questions are, are hopefully getting us to that point. And I, John's at every single meeting too, but I think we really need to have them reporting to the school committee because we, ultimately we are going to be left with right. what's, what's ever done or not done in that building. I mean, listen, they have done a fantastic job yep. with this building. There's no question about that. But now that we're coming down to the wire and we are increasingly becoming nervous about the state of the building as it's gonna be left to us, which is, you know, it's great, but obviously there's things we need we need fixed. We need to be able to hold people accountable, especially people who are paying a lot of money uh, to do stuff. So I, I, you know, and it's it's now like I said earlier, it's now our prerogative. Now that we're occupying these buildings, it's our prerogative as well. So uh, I look forward to them joining us at the next meeting. Um, anything else? No, sorry, open up a can of worms. If that's yeah, well, listen, it is a can of worms. Do we have at, um, like a collection of school building committee minutes that we can have available so that when we, when they say some, you know, it's we have differing viewpoints of the understanding of like the M what the MDF room, MDF yeah. room yeah. that we can say well here on the minutes you know it was explained to you on this date and I mean <coughs> the minutes should be available on the website. Minutes are out. I know. I haven't read them because I just joined the, the thing, but I, I know they do have them. They have. Okay. Katie, so many of these dialogues take place offline that it's. There are subcommittees. We meet down in Tony's area. It, um, it's hard to. I, I, yeah. I've had countless, and that's when I asked Jim to get involved because it, it, you kept getting answers that sounded like there were technical problems that I shouldn't I shouldn't know about. That's so when Jim stepped in, we're still at the same place. So. But you won't be able to trace a lot of them because they're, they're continual conversations offline. All right. Uh, can I just add to yeah. Currently, the high school building committee is still in charge of this building. Correct? Yes. And it's not going to be turned over to us. It's going to be turned over to the DPW. Correct? Mm, because the of Department course. of Public Works owns the buildings. I don't believe so. I do believe it gets turned over to the school committee. DPW the school maintains committee. them, but the school committee has the jurisdiction over the buildings themselves. Okay. Well, anyway, it's not going to be turned over from the high school building committee until a good number of those items on that punch list are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And it's also my understanding that, in essence, the high school building, well, the high school project answerable to a troika. There's the architect drew up the plans. Then there's the contractor, the general contractor. That's Gilbane. And uh, the off, um, Tim Murphy, who is, what's his title? I forget. OPM. The, owner project the OPM, which is, means what? Owner project manager. Owner project manager. So there's that troika of people who are carrying this deal forward. And I don't want to give away some information that came up at a executive session, but there is tension between them, as there should be, and uh, that tension is continuing. There, there's no one saying we're just going to roll over and accept things. Good. And that's why I think it's very important not to spread rumors. There's some people out there who still regret the fact that we ever appropriated the money to build this in the first place. 
but the building is 99% right. done well. Uh, and we're talking about a figure, a ballpark of less than 1%. Yep. And that's what we are hoping to whittle down. Mm -hmm. I just went off of that. That's my clarification, and my think, interpretation. And I agree with you. I think that that's... Well, okay. Yeah. I'm really saying it so the audience, yeah. if there is one listening to us, will not get alarmed that the building's in trouble. Right. It's not. Okay. It's moving no, forward in a very respectable manner. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. It would just, it, it's unfortunate to have these things overshadow the building and how well it's come out when it's in, but, and these are not small. It's not to be, I don't want to <coughs> diminish the importance of them or mm -hmm. overstate them. It's things that we're taking seriously because we value the amount of money and time and effort that's right. gone into it. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, and I think that our colleagues on the school building committee feel the same way. We want to ensure that this project is done the way the town intended it. Uh, and now that we're here and, and living in it, you know, these, these issues are our problems as, as well as their, the school building committee's problems. You know? and, and we, I think, have an obligation, and I hope the community would want us to have an obligation to ensure that the school building committee is, is right where they need to be on some of the issues that we think are important, like, you know, our servers, which we do own and we do have to pay for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last time we lost servers, Kevin had to spend how many days? Three days? Four days pulling assessor records off so we can get tax bills out in time. I mean, that's not a adequate scenario for us. Okay. So. There's one other uh, fact I sure. think that's relevant, and that's before every um, high school building committee meeting, there's a tour conducted by Tim Murphy and the architect is usually there, and the contractor. So those of us who are on that committee can actually eyeball the situation, and, and you see something like doors that didn't close properly right. or didn't even meet each other, um, and ask why. So when we get to the, the meeting, we have some empirical information to work from. And, uh, and right. that adds to uh, holding their feet to the fire and keeping it responsible. Well, that actually is a really good point that you just brought up, and I'm wondering if it would be beneficial for them to conduct a similar tour with us next week before our, or in two weeks before our meeting. I think that would be a great idea. How do we feel about that? Okay, and then we can ask them those questions on camera too, so. All right, so I will, uh, one of us will. <laughs> We'll put that out there. So, you know, how long are those tours? Usually an hour? About an hour. Okay, so we'll say like 545. Try to arrange it so that we have enough time. Okay, cool. You're saying before our September 9th? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably right before that meeting. If that, does everybody think that's a good idea? So, okay, cool. And moving right along. Uh, legislative update. Uh, the Great General Court is not in session, so there's nothing happening. And they have a good excuse for that now. They're not in session. Right. <laughs> as much as happening now as used to happen. Yes. <laughs> All right. Green Team. And before Liz goes uh, for Green Team, I attended the custodian's luncheon the other day, and Liz works really hard uh, for with Arlene and with everybody to make sure that this building opened with all of the right uh, buckets and all of the right components to ensure that the recycling uh, program here works. Uh, and so I just want to give Liz some recognition because last week we did get together and thank the custodians for everything they do to make sure that the recycling happens at all the buildings, but Liz and Arlene Miller have really been a driving force to make sure that happens, so thank you. Um, well, I was just going to talk about quickly the um, uh, thank you party that we did have for the custodians. Um, we want to thank you um, for getting the buildings back in great shape um, for this week and um, also everything that they do throughout the year and in terms of keeping the building clean and also their tremendous efforts um, with the recycling and keeping it going with all the schools. So thank you. And um, I think that's all we have right now. Sure. John, you have a question? I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but um, are we going to try and do something about plastic bottles and styrofoam 
I know styrofoam has been on the agenda for a number of years, and plastic bottles is a major problem in terms of you know uh, trash and, and, and they're, they're not being recycled properly. Right. Can we do anything in terms of a school system well, to help alleviate the, the problems both of those engender? Um, styrofoam, uh, I believe that we have talked to Whitson's, our new food service company, and that um, we expressed to them that we did not want styrofoam used. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens with that um, in terms of cost for trays and getting trays for every, for every student. Um, and then the bottles, it's really hard because that's something that um, we make money off of, of the vending machines for bottles. Um, so we'll have to visit that with food service as well. But I'm gonna, we're going to have a recycling meeting in September. I'm going to arrange it <coughs> for our green team, and we can talk about it. Okay. And I would just add real quick, I did talk to Megan Schwartz this morning, who is the community service learning teacher as well as the history department chair and she actually just became certified as a green teacher. So she's a green instructor and the first project that community service learning will be working on this year is being pushed along by a grant that she applied for with Arlene Miller uh, which would give them some funding to buy bottles, reusable plastic bottles that would have like a Lancer logo or a Longmeadow High School logo that they're going to sell to the student body and then continue to produce them. So, but they're made out of plastic. They are made out of plastic, or they could plastic be metal. Plastic is a no-no. We're not supposed to go near plastic. They might be metal. They might be metal. Well, if they're metal, then I hope they're stainless steel, not aluminum. I, I yeah. I've been I mean, reading about this issue. Yes. And, and I think it, you know we're we're trying to be a green school, mm -hmm. and we're gearing up for the 21st century. This is a crucial problem. There's a new bottle bill being sponsored by uh, a number of folks for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it's been fought by a large number of vested interests who do not want to see any change. They want to keep on selling carbonated beverages and in plastic containers, even though there's some uh, evidence now that uh, chemicals leak from the plastic bottle into the okay. fluid that's contained therein. So now I just raise this as yeah. an issue. I, I really think we ought to get going on this. We've been talking about it for years, and I'm not blaming Liz because. She and I were on the Green Committee when this came up a couple of years ago, and we've been pushing it, so just want to... Yeah, we'll get more information on what Megan's working on. Um, keep the fire going. Yeah. Plus, as you walk through the new high school, we've got these really great water fountains that are four bottles, so, you know, pretty good. So, nifty. All right, op sub. <coughs> Let's get together. I, I actually thought for both for OPSEB cover too, OPSEB and middle school working group. Uh, my proposal was I'm going to kind of email amongst my teammates here and create a charter for both and then show it next in our next um, meeting. Sure. And see if we can get concurrence on the charter to say, you know, what do you, here's what the team's meant to do. And then if we all go, you know, gay barely, that sounds good to me, we'll go off and do it. I would just caution. Uh, how you email them. I know. Make sure, you're, make I know. sure you're okay. I, I'll figure that out. Yeah, <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> Don't break the law. Uh, that sounds fun. I so. mean, the charter will be presented here, right? So we won't go right. off in March without getting the charter approved by everybody. So, but <clears throat> instead of setting off teams, you know, go forth and do something, uh, I think getting concurrence with everybody what the actual plan would be or mm -hmm. what the main what objective would be would be a good thing. Great. Seal? Um, nothing new. Uh, policy. Uh, we'll start meeting September. Okay. Great. How about Lower Pioneer Bell? Oh, collaborative, sorry. Okay. Uh, we had our first meeting last for the new season uh, last Wednesday. Pretty much routine, uh, you know, fund allocation. But everyone should be aware that we're now in um, collective bargaining with the bus drivers. And that's a number of people in the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative who are dependent on bus drivers. And um, so that's ongoing. There's nothing to report right now. Thanks, John. All right, other. Um, oh, I do have one piece before we move on to Marie. Um, I have drafted, and I forgot to send around, but I've drafted the proposed warrant article for Ball Town meeting regarding the uh, Ian Wax Tree of Courage in the front hallway. 
Uh, and basically, as the Warren article is written now, the funds that are collected would go to support student uh, community service activities. And Tom had mentioned that we may not want to limit ourselves to community service activities if, for instance, we could support students going on a trip or students, something we talked about earlier. And so I'm going to probably change the language to just say student activities, um, although there's still a grant uh, process that is involved in that aspect of it. So that's, we don't really need to take any action on it because the committee did get me, <coughs> give me permission to write it. So I'll send it out to you. Have we submitted uh, language for it? No, but it's well, been reviewed by town council. But aren't, it's what? It has been reviewed by town council. So then why aren't we submitting it? I was going to make that one change and then give it to them. We have till September 5th to, yeah, to I was going to say, we're up against a deadline. We're up against the deadline. It's written. I'm going to make one change, uh, but I just wanted to give you all that information about that change so that down the road we don't limit ourselves to just saying it's for community <clears throat> service projects when there could be a worthy cause. Um, but it is good to go. So I'm going to make that change tomorrow, get it back to Dave Martell, and we should be good. So is, that, is it going to... Is it going to have like, the same approval board yeah. that it will go through? Yeah, and that's, I mean, the Warren article is not concerning how funds are distributed per se. It's about what the qualification for money to be spent is. Oh, okay, and if we, if we say community service, then we... It, we're uh, okay. relegated to that. Okay. Um, and basically, the way that we have to write it is that because we're the... Uh, Originally, we were going to leave it to the high school to decide what's good, and we're still going to, do, you know, leave it to Larry and whatever team he assembles. But they will; it will have to be approved by this board every time there's a grant, which is not uncommon. Um, so, that's just what I wanted to bring up real quick. And Marie, curriculum review. Okay. <clears throat> Coming from budget concerns, the question arose: how we can begin to address curriculum needs. Um, without having to come back at the end of the year for money. So Jim and I were talking about curriculum reviews and I thought this would be a good time to just go through what a curriculum review is and how we're going to be working on it over the next several years. Uh, the, it's a continuous cycle and the very first thing is student achievement. We want all of our students to excel and so the question is how do we help them excel? Uh, and we do that through planning the curriculum, making sure that we identify what kids should know and be able to do and that we are able to identify what supports we have in place when they don't when they don't know it or they know more than they um, than their peers do once curriculum is in place we go through instructional strategies and with the instructional strategies comes um, the need for materials as teachers decide how they're going to teach it, how they're going to implement it, what materials are, are needed to do that. And that's frequent when we come back to school co committee looking for money. Once instruction begins, then we assess students to see if learning is taking place so that you have the curriculum, it's being taught. Are students really mastering it? Are they learning? And we're, we're looking at assessment tools that we, we talked about grade and GMADE no longer being effective with the Common Core. We're looking and talking about Ames Web, and we're looking at other um, assessment tools right now that we'll be coming back and sharing with you more. Once students are assessed, you have students that don't that have not made progress, substantial progress, and that's where RTI comes in. We've talked a lot about that. Response to intervention, where tier one is when students get help in the classroom. Curriculum is differentiated. Curriculum is broken down so that students are either being challenged or given extra help. Tier two is when they actually get a double dose of the class that they're taking so that they may get double math or they may get double ELA so that you can help them master the material. The, um, the third tier is when they need more extensive services, for example, special education, because it's not helping to give them that intensive second tier of learning uh, and that they're going to need more on a long-term basis. So that, that's basically the cycle. And, and once you do those interventions, it goes back where you're looking at student achievement and you begin all over again. Okay? Any questions on that part? Jim. On timing, I think the issue for me is timing. <coughs> it is. Right, is because this instruction kind of purple block down here yep. is when the teachers are deciding what they want or what they need for their curriculum that they plan coming up. You know, that's, that's when we're asking the question of, hey, what, what, 
what books do you need? What facilities do you need? What technology do you need? Um, it has to be early enough in the year to allow us to to assess it and vote on it and get the mon money, you know, uh, to it and that type of thing. And that's where it gets a little bit complicated. For example, one of the issues that we ran into this year was the reading books for the middle school. Uh, so when we needed those books, the work had been done on the curriculum the last week in June. Extra money became available, so we were able to let teachers do more curriculum work than we had planned, and which is what we wanted to mm -hmm. do. But coming from that, their new instruction included these books. So it was last minute because we were able to fund this, this, this staff development. The dilemma with the budget is that we don't put money aside for curriculum materials, and we don't really fund enough for teachers to be working on um, curriculum and instruction. And we're always, um, <clears throat> we're always looking for end of the year funds to do that. The solution would be to build it into the budget, but in the past when that was done and we built in $100,000 for materials, that's always one of the things that's taken out of the budget. Well, I think we ought to bring that up in our FIN sub meeting. I think there's a way around that. Uh, okay. Without bringing this meeting down right now, I think we can talk about that. I mean, I really w would like a timeline that allows us to take appropriate action without getting right down to the very crunch. You know, it allows us time to, to think about it, talk about it, decide, you know, appropriately what should be done. And with the curriculum review, that's going to help, but I, ca I, I can't say that it will always solve the problem because there are initiatives that come up that no matter how much we try to plan, you can't, you can't predict that they're going to come up and that, that um, th things like the, the books because there are changes in curriculum and then you get the group together in instruction. But let's take a look at the review because I think this will answer a lot of the mm -hmm. questions that you have. A curriculum review should be done where everything is studied. In the past couple of years, we've spent time, the very first curriculum review that I initiated was um, elementary literacy. They were, if you looked at the MCAS data and you talked to teachers, students were having problems reading and writing. So that was the very first thing that we did. We then moved into the middle school literacy. We did that early enough so that we knew we were going to need materials, but what we haven't clearly identified is what's going to happen over the next three to four years. And that's what this chart's beginning to do. We've given two years um, to almost every cycle so that we know the first year they'll be looking at the curriculum, they'll be identifying instruction, and at the end of that first year, they should be given either money to buy the materials or to pilot. But definitely by the end of the second year, they should have funds to purchase um, the materials that they need. When it's their curriculum review year, then they should be definitely allocated funds. Now part of the dilemma will be if you take a look in 2013, you, there will be several reviews going on. Social studies will be a major one. We'll start, um, we'll start PE that hasn't started yet. We'll look at um, special education and we'll continue with the high school math. So out of those areas, we won't know until we get into the review how much money they're going to need. Uh, and I can't predict that until they get into it, so that it, it's very hard to budget. But I think going to finance subcommittee, it would definitely be worth having a discussion. Is there's a way that you could suggest that would help us fund better than what we're currently yeah, I doing? Think, I think um, a more detailed conversation in FinSub, but, but an easy uh, initial approach would be uh, you're expecting a curriculum review to produce some results that would say, I need to buy something, change it. The curriculum review probably would not likely come out with no change. Correct. Assuming, right? I mean, so so if you say any curriculum review I do, if I have to if I have to buy new texts for a normal class, it's somewhere between five and ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. My rough span of numbers, right? And so you say, hey, if I'm doing five new curriculum reviews, finance sub school committee school budget, you're on the hook somewhere between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars for books. Yeah, well, right. some can be 75000 Right, so you sit there and say, we ought to at least take that and we can start kind of broad basing. Well, if that's the case, where would this come from? Right. right so those are the kind of conversations we could have in FinSub, but I, uh, to assume that nothing will come out of a curriculum review would be wrong, or else we wouldn't oh, be it doing will, it, right? Oh, it will come. So, so we know in the year 2013 now, we're doing all these reviews, uh, that there is going to be some requests coming from them. Yep. Right? And we can prepare ourselves for it. Right. I'm not too sure how we, right now, but we could we could go do that, and it's part of the FinSub. 
smiling. And, and some of it, Jim, is more predictable. When I talk to the um, high school social studies teachers, they've clearly already identified they need a, need a new book or a new online learning uh, okay. tool for the students. But like things like PE, I don't know. I don't know what materials they need. Would they move into health? So that would be uh, a no, more that's fair. precarious that's guess. Fair. I'm just saying, for every one of those that are just starting in 2013, we know yep. that there is a request that would be coming our way. Yes. Right. Yes. We hope, anyway. Definitely. Right. Oh, I'm sure there will be. Okay. So. So I think that's how we would. Talk. So we can talk about it in more detail, but I think we can lay that out. Okay, but this this is helpful because this means that um, at least every five years, you're looking at the curriculum, you're working on it, you're um, enhancing it. There are some things like literacy that should never be taken off the curriculum review because you need to continually work at that to improve that. RTI and other things should continually be going um, on too. Also, if you note at the bottom, there are certain things that we're working on that will have cost implications as well. You have RTI assessment, the district determined measure committees, educator evaluation may, ATLAS universal screening. So that as we're embedding these into our curriculum uh, reviews, it's this type of thing that will also add cost to what we're doing. So, any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm doing this a little bit, so forgive me. Good question. <laughs> um, when we're doing going through the review process, are we reviewing what they're currently doing right now against the Common Core and what other high schoolers and middle schoolers and elementary schoolers are doing in other school districts so that we can try and, and, and also taking that information and comparing it to our MCAS scores? Like, how do we get um, to the end result as to what they feel they need? For example, literacy, we gave out literature on best practices. We, um, t we send people out to wor workshops and conferences with some of the best people in the country. Uh, last summer we, br we brought in, um, this past summer, th this one, we brought in someone from associated with Columbia University on writing. So we try and find the best in the field and we send at least some people out. Then we do some reading and we talk about it. We do look at what other districts are doing, if they've done well on things like the MCAS or if they just, you know, a reputation that we've heard about. So we do check in with them. And after we do that, then we begin to break it down. What do we want to do? We actually identify what everyone's doing at every single grade level. And for literacy, it was around what are you doing in writing? What are you doing in um, reading? There's vocabulary. There are all these facets t to that. <clears throat> and once that all broken down, you have to, you have to somehow get it together. I'll give you an example writing. We had um, the staff in K through 5 all brought in what was considered an average writing sample, and it's, it's a sorting <coughs> method that you do. We then hung up three from, um, every teacher brought one from their grade, and when you hung them up and looked at them, you could tell that, um, that third to fourth grade there was a dip in writing that the writing was not, the expectations were not as high by comparing writing. So we use all kinds of tools like that, and then we bring out exemplars from the MCAS so people can say. But then when you get to that, you're redoing the curriculum, and uh, then you're setting expectations. When you have exemplars, too, for example, the fourth grade teachers knew, okay, we knew that we have to ratchet it up some, because the writing is, is not as um, progressing at the same speed as some of the other grades. Okay. Thanks. That was a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love having the whiteboard here too. This is mm -hmm. nice. There's no fidgeting. It's great. You guys are always doing it through the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The lights go off in here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Just turned off. They're just turned off. Sorry, I've been watching the lights go off in the hallway. Yeah, that would be <laughs> right. So, all right. Next up is the approval of warrants. Thank you, Matt. Okay. I move that the school committee approve the warrant batch number 2200 of the school lunch fund dated 30 August 2013 in the amount of $23,309.94. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? <coughs> Motion carries. Seven. Uh, if, if I could, uh, just for clarification, someone asked me about this. Why are we spending money? It's because we collect the money, and then we have to pass it on to 
the person or, or the uh, uh, food service provider. That's why we have this little bit of information for, on school lunch money. Yeah. We collect it and then we distribute it. Correct. And get billed by the vendor. Correct. Very good. A person came up and asked me that in the big Y the other day. So. People watch and it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. 2201. Okay. I move the school committee approve the warrant batch number 2201 of the general operating fund for fiscal year mm -hmm. 2014. Uh, that fund dated 30 August 2013 and the amount of $356,932.84. I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor? All motion right. carries. I move that the school committee approve the warrant batch number 2202 of the Special Revenues and Grants Fund dated 30 August 2013 in the amount of $31,732.66. And second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? The motion carries. <clears throat> and that's it. That's it for warrants. There is no consent agenda. There are no minutes tonight. There is an executive session, however. So I will need a motion, and this motion requires a roll call vote. I move that the school committee adjourn to, <coughs> excuse me, into executive session for the purpose of strategy as it relates to litigation <coughs> where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body to reconvene in well, second into, into open session. session. Second. Motion. Okay. Okay. The motion requires a roll call vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back on September 9th at 7 p.m. in this room. Have a great night. Now we're supposed to wait like 30.